A Missionary Called by Joseph Center Part 1, Chapter 26 I think about why I am writing this confession to you. I mean, yes, it is for you, for your information, but it is just as much a catharsis for me. So I am surprised by my mind's present insistence to turn now to Ellie. I've been sitting down here, writing and crying, and the patheticness of it all has certainly assisted the decision for two days now, and I'm about to explode. I cannot keep my mind off her. The problem is that I do not feel like I deserve to even think about her, much less see her. It seems necessary, though, in order to just get past her and on to what I must do. So I'm sorry, but this next part isn't remotely for your benefit. You already know everything about her and me. Feel free, Aaron, to skip ahead. All through grade school and junior high, Eloise Crane and I sat either right next to each other in class or at the same island of desks. From middle school and junior high on through high school, our lockers were always neighbors. We even rode the same bus. This kind of history necessitated one or two of a few relationship possibilities. Enemies, friends, and maybe either of these combined with some degree of rivalry. However, simply for the fact that Ellie was probably the friendliest student in the school district and me the shyest, animus and rivalry were never likely. Ellie, despite her gregariousness, was awkward and clumsy. Pretty, I thought, but a klutz, and the popular kids liked to laugh at her. Of course, those same kids didn't even know I existed. I got attention when someone needed homework help, but that was about it. No one discovered until high school that the real go-to guy for anything academic was actually Tommy, but he was so weird back then that no one dared get close enough to find out. Homework, as it turned out, was the original and, in smaller part, continuing foundation of Ellie and my relationship. She could not manage math and had a terrible time with spelling. On the other hand, I was terribly lazy and never got around to doing my homework, despite the relative ease with which I could do it. We engaged in a basic trade. I helped her figure out the stuff she did not already get, and the following morning she would let me copy all the work. But it was not cheating, I was just checking her work while doing my own. Up through most of middle school, Ellie had her friends and I had mine, so we only saw each other in class and on the bus. We did not hang out together on the playground, we did not go to each other's houses on the weekends. Then, toward the end of sixth grade, and after a nasty falling out with a few of her friends, Ellie abandoned them and made a surprise visit to Tommy, Casper, and my corner of the playground under the crabapple tree. She fit right in. Through junior high and the first years of high school, we all hung out whenever we could. She joined us for lunch, we met for football and basketball games, and sat way up at the top of the bleachers where we could freely point and gossip. It was not until driver's licenses arrived sometime later that we, all of us, were able to see each other outside of school functions. Junior year brought our first prom. By now, the four of us were no longer social outcasts. We were not popular by any means, but our talents had all caught up with us and provided grounds for at least minimal respect in the hallways. Casper was an artist and painted beautifully. Tommy was a genius. I did a little of everything and I gained some respect from a scholarship I got for my sophomore writing portfolio. Ellie had grown out of her clumsy stage and she was beautiful and friendly. She would have been welcomed openly to the inner sanctum of popularity, maybe even without the typical and requisite rites of passage or the accoutrements. Instead, she stayed with us. Despite our relatively new and general acceptance among the fake baked butter blondes and their meathead boyfriends, we were collectively and wholly surprised when the four of us were voted by the seniors to chair the prom committee. This really would not have been any big deal except for one thing. As chairpersons to prom, we were expected to attend. This was no problem for Casper or Tommy. They were not shy. They got dates early and without drama. I was mortified. They both offered to ask someone for me, but that was just weird. I didn't know what I was going to do. Two weeks before the dance, Mr. Douglas, the faculty advisor, approached me. Eugene, I know it's not easy to ask someone out on a date, especially to something as big as prom, but you gotta go. I looked at my shoes. What are you gonna do if I don't? I asked him in my head. Look, I was talking to my wife about you, the advisor said, and I cringed. She teaches over at Botano and says she knows a girl who'd be perfect for you. I looked up again. The embarrassment of the suggestion was actually physically painful. I'm sorry, but I can't go with someone I don't even know. Well, he continued, here's the deal. Either you get off your butt and ask someone to the dance, or I set you up with her. She's a good sport. She'll go for it. 
I said something under my breath. I don't even remember what it was. I was angry, though I would not show it. What was that? He asked. I'll ask someone. Good. Tell me Monday who it is, and I'll call off the dogs. Tommy had walked over at just that moment. The dogs? Mr. Dugman, who you setting Eugene up with? It was the hardest thing I had ever done. No one knew it. I was opaque as lead. I would never have gone out with anyone who was not Eloise Crane, but I had no idea how to do it. I had known since fourth grade that I was going to marry her, and the passing years only confirmed it. Of course, by then, I had mostly outgrown the delusions, but I still fostered back-burner fantasies. I wondered how many guys had asked her to the dance, and who she might be considering, though I would not dare ask her to find out. She would want to know why I cared, and I could not lie to her. I stewed for two days. I could hardly look at her Friday night when we all went to a movie. I was glad it was dark. I blushed every time she laughed, and especially when she would lean over to whisper in my ear something about the movie. I never blushed around her before, so why now? Just because I was finally going to ask her out? Stupid. Just because after so many years I was finally going to offer a hint or clue that I'd had a crush on her for half my life? Stupid. Saturday night, I got to the 7-Eleven early and prayed that Ellie would get there before Casper and Tommy. She did. She found me at our spot behind the store on the picnic table and sat next to me. I knew if I waited, it would not happen, and I had to ask her before the other two showed up. I clamped my eyes shut hard and blurted, Would you like to go to the prom with me? There was the briefest pause, like literally just a half second, then, Yep. My eyes flashed open. There was a sudden rushing cold across my lap. I'd squeezed my Slurpee and it gushed out the top of its cup. Really? Yes. She was smiling. I smiled so wide it hurt. Thanks, I said and I had to fight down the rising giddiness. She was grinning, her lips closed, and her eyes sparkled. You're welcome. It was a triple date. Casper drove his dad's van and merely acted the chauffeur. House by house, he taxied around and we all piled in, each boy ensuring the safe passage of the hem of his date's dress from the ground into the rusty old Dodge. We bumped and rattled all the way down into Pleasanton, where there was an olive garden. Then it was back to the high school for the dance. Everything went well. Did you catch that? Everything went well. Easy, carefree, happy, even relaxed. I was not even nervous. It was so natural being with Ellie that even the change in perspective from friend to date did not blow it. The entire night I succeeded in pushing back the one terrifying thing. The post-date, front porch, good night. Transportation logistics were ridiculous and only exacerbated my anxiety. Tommy had the solution. Skip the otherwise necessary micromanagement of curfews, distances, getting everyone to the right place and in the right order at the right time. Casper and his date dropped off Tommy and his date at Tommy's house, and Ellie and me at my house. He tootled his horn and drove off. You were still up watching something with Dad, but you turned it off to see Ellie's dress and get another look at me in a tux before I drove her home. You clicked a couple pictures. In front of Ellie's house, I got out of the car, walked around, and opened her door. The hinges creaked. She took my hand as she stood, and the springs in her seat squeaked. Every nerve ending in my soul screeched and resisted the inevitable front door confrontation. I hate confrontation. I walked her to the door. She held my arm. I blushed. She turned to face me. Thanks, she said. Brilliantly, I replied, Thanks, too. See you Monday. Good night. And I turned to go. Hold on just one second, Buster. I stopped halfway down the porch steps. What? I'd say you're stupid if I didn't know better. What? You know exactly what, Eugene. There was a sharp bite of impatience. I was not good at playing dumb, but I gave it my best shot. What'd I do? She rolled her eyes. You have been in love with me since seventh grade when I grew my hair out. Four years, maybe even more than that for all I know, Mr. Mysterious. And now we've finally had our first date prom, and all you're going to do is say, see you Monday? Um, and you're not denying it, Eugene. You know it's true, just like I do. Sorry? I asked. You are so maddeningly passive. I looked up again and threw out my hands. What do you want me to do? She also threw out her hands and leaned forward. She nearly shouted, shut up and kiss me, dummy. I had accomplished the hardest thing in my life, to finally ask out the girl of my dreams, 
but I had never kissed someone before. Feel free to be surprised. I did not know if she had or not. I had never asked. I had thought to ask. I mean, I had wanted to kiss her, just like she had said, since seventh grade and been in some kind of love with her since long before. But since the hair thing, whatever it was, I do not remember. Man, she was right. I had never been able to stop staring at her neck, especially when she pulled her hair back in a ponytail and how it showed off her little oval ears. What a doofus. But I had hesitated too long. Ellie sighed, stared at me hard, and rolled her eyes again. Good night, then. She opened the front door, looked over her shoulder, and said, Maybe I'll see you Monday. And I let her go. I kicked myself all the way to the car. I fretted and stewed all night and all weekend. I called her Sunday. Do you like to fish? I asked as soon as I knew it was her on the line and not her mom. What? Pole, bobber, worms, fish? Fish. I don't know. Are you asking me out? I guess so. You guess? And she sounded irritated. Yes. I'm asking you out. She was quiet. I asked again, and with as much confidence as I could muster. Would you like to go fishing with me? This is a date? Well, I was hoping it might be. She hesitated. So the best you can do to follow up prom is ask me to go fishing? Not if you don't want to go. I thought we could, you know, talk. She was clearly thinking about it. So do you want to come? I asked. She hesitated some more, and I think she was doing it on purpose, not because she was thinking about it. Not if what happened last night is going to happen again. I grinned. Well, I don't think I can promise anything. She was quiet again. But I'll do my best. I'm pretty new at all this, you know. Yeah? Cut me a little slack? Where are we fishing? My place. Come pick me up? Now? Fifteen minutes. We went fishing. Sort of. I do not know why in the world fishing should be so much more socially intimidating than going to prom, but my hand shook so much that I could hardly get a worm on the hook. Ellie kept trying to step in and help, but I was too busy attempting chivalry to notice. In the meantime, Horace had joined us from wherever he had been skulking in the woods and sat to watch the bobbers on the water. Over the next two hours, we talked and managed to cast the line out a few times, though we did not catch anything, much to the cat's disappointment. Finally, with the sun setting and tension building, we put aside the poles and sat down on a fallen tree. She was closer than she had ever been. Why are you so nervous? she asked. It's just me, Eugene. This isn't any different for you? Yeah. You're not nervous? I think you're nervous enough for both of us. Great. It's cute. Yeah? Oh, come on, Eugene, give yourself a break. I paused. I did not care about the cuteness of it, not at the moment, or even that she had commented on it. I know it was supposed to have been okay last night. I mean, you said so. Well, you told me to anyway. I mumbled and stuttered. I have no idea what I said after that, but it went on and on, and then, finally, after minutes, I leaned over and kissed her. It was fast and clumsy, and actually felt more of teeth than lips. Ellie grinned. I was more nervous than ever. Was that your first kiss? A wave of defensiveness washed over me. Yes. Me too. Really? She nodded, still smiling. A smile that was not amused or entertained. It was happy. How was it? Now she laughed. I don't know. I think I missed it. I inhaled all the way to my toes. I did not know what to say and... Want to try again? Came out all on its own. She fought back her smile and nodded. This time we turned to face each other. I put my hands on her face. Her eyes were closed. I was too busy not screwing it up again to close mine, and besides, I did not trust my aim even with my eyes open. Her eyes fluttered open, and she looked at me briefly before closing them again and moved in. Softly and perfectly. Electric. We met in the middle, entirely enthralled for all of about three seconds. I backed up, trembling for the sensation of it. Ellie opened her eyes. We both managed to say nothing. We sat and watched the sun. Horace had moved in and sat next to us. Eventually, it was dark and late. We were holding hands. I was not sure when it had happened or who had taken whose hand first. Then we walked back up the path, through the woods, through the cemetery, back to the car, and I took her home. On her front porch, we kissed again. See you tomorrow? I asked. See you tomorrow, she said.